Welcome to the Upper Register, your online resource for Reformed Biblical Theology. My name is Dr. Charles Lee Irons. In this episode, I want to talk about the usefulness of biblical theology. And actually, I want to do it over several episodes and talk about the usefulness of biblical theology in four areas. For hermeneutics, for preaching, for systematic theology, and for ethics. And so today I want to talk about the usefulness of biblical theology for hermeneutics. So what is hermeneutics? Well, first of all, hermeneutics is from the Greek word hermeneo, which means to translate or to interpret. And so hermeneutics then is the study of the principles of biblical interpretation. And these principles are widely known. People and theologians and biblical scholars have talked about how you need to look at the literary genre of the passage. For example, is it historical narrative? Is it wisdom literature? Is it apocalyptic literature? And so on. And understanding the literary genre will have a significant impact on how you interpret any given text. Additionally, we need to study the historical context the geographical context, the political context, the cultural context. Uh, it's going to be different interpreting the book of Acts in a first century Roman context versus interpreting the book of Daniel, which was written in a Babylonian context. So the historical and cultural context is very significant, and hermeneutics involves looking at those things. But all of these issues genre, historical context, all these different elements of interpretation and hermeneutics are geared towards one specific issue, and that is trying to understand the intent of the original author, authorial intent. But how do we, how do we determine the authorial intent? Well, of course, we know the answer to that is context. The context is the key to determining the author's intent. And the context could not only refer to the historical and cultural context, but specifically to the literary context. Understanding any particular verse in light of the paragraph, and then in light of the chapter, in light of the whole book. But when we're interpreting scripture, we are in a unique situation because we're not dealing with ordinary human literature. We're dealing with a unique kind of literature in which Yes, there are human authors, Moses and Isaiah and Ezekiel and Paul, but those human authors are merely the instruments for God, who is the ultimate author of Scripture. We believe in the inspiration of Scripture, and so therefore God is the ultimate author speaking through these various human authors. And so therefore the ultimate goal is not merely to determine the original author's intent, it is also to determine God's intent speaking through the human author. And that can only be determined by seeing how any given text is situated in the context of the organism of covenant history. So, of course, we know with hermeneutics that the, the first three rules of hermeneutics are context, context, context. But what kind of context are we talking about? I've already mentioned the historical and cultural context. I've mentioned the literary context of the verse, the chapter, the book, and so on. But the ultimate context, the most important context, the one that will give us the divine author's meaning, is the organism of covenant history. And so this is where biblical theology is so helpful for hermeneutics because biblical theology is the study of that organism. It's the study of the unfolding progressive organism of special revelation as it develops throughout covenant history, from Adam to the post-fall first promise of the gospel, all the way into the new covenant. So if our goal is to understand the intent of the divine author, speaking through the human author, we must use biblical theology as our hermeneutical key for interpretation. God administers his kingdom through various covenants in history. And therefore, 
anytime we see a text or a passage or a book or a paragraph in scripture, we have to ask ourselves how this passage is associated with a specific covenant. We can even see um, in the very names of the two parts of the Bible. The Bible is divided into two sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Of course, Testament is another term for covenant. And so you could just say Old Covenant and New Covenant. So the very fact that the Bible itself is divided into those two sections, Old Covenant and New Covenant, tells you that Scripture is covenantal, that all of special revelation is associated with covenants, which are the instruments by which God administers his kingdom as the organism of God's special revelation develops throughout history. So perhaps rather than speaking of the, the authors of the various books of the Bible uh, using that term author, perhaps we should use the biblical term, which is prophets. You know, uh, Hebrews 1, verse 1. God, at various ways and in various times in the past, spoke to the fathers by the prophets. Uh, Romans 1, verse 2. Uh, the gospel, which God promised beforehand through his holy prophets in the holy scriptures. So the prophets, then, are the authors of scripture. And when we view them as prophets and not merely as authors, that helpfully connects the divine and the human, doesn't it? Because prophets, by their very nature, are not simply authors speaking their own mind. Prophets are ministers of God's covenants, and therefore they are serving God's purpose and God's will and are communicating God's revelation to his people. The prophets were ministers of the Old Covenant. For example, in Hebrews 3, verse 5, the author of Hebrews looks at Moses and says, Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. So he was a servant. He was a prophet. He was, he was a servant in God's house as he's building God's house, not only in the literal sense of building the tabernacle, but in the figurative sense of uh, establishing God's covenant relationship with his people and setting up all of the administering the uh, um, God's covenant relationship and, and even speaking about the future, testifying to the things that were to be spoken later. And so this way of viewing the biblical authors as prophets and not simply as authors, of course they are authors, but they're a specific kind of author, they're prophets, that helps us to see that, that, that God is the primary author of Scripture, and that helps us also to connect the authorial intent to the ultimate context, which is not simply the historical and cultural context, not simply the literary context, but the organism of God's unfolding, progressive revelation of himself uh, from before the fall to after the fall, to the first promise of the gospel, and so on. Uh, Meredith Klein, in his book, The Structure of Biblical Authority, on page 46, has this wonderful quote. He says, The human dimensions of the Old Testament are to be duly appreciated, but it is supremely important that we apprehend in faith the Old Testament's claim that God is its primary author. If we do, we will see that the Old Testament is more than an anthology of various types of literature produced by a series of authors across a span of centuries. We will understand that it all issued ultimately from the throne room of God's, excuse me, from the throne room of Israel's heavenly king, and that all its literary forms possess a functional unity as instruments of Yahweh's ongoing covenantal oversight of the conduct and faith of his vassal people. I just love that quote because he's helping us to understand the covenantal nature of scripture. Scripture is more than an anthology of various types of literature produced by a number of different human authors. Rather, the Old Testament is the it, it, it is um, the revelation of God himself as he is issuing his word 
from his heavenly throne, but doing so in the form of covenantal administration. He's administering his kingdom through his special revelation, through his prophets. The prophets are helping to administer and to oversee the conduct and faith of God's vassal people. And so all that they say and do is going to be covenantal. It's going to be shaping God's covenant community. It's going to be providing direction for the historical process and growth of this organism of special revelation. So hermeneutics then is the study of the principles of biblical interpretation. And my uh, concern about hermeneutics as it is so often explained, and there are whole books on hermeneutics that you can read, is that they focus on context only in that narrow sense of the literary context or the historical and cultural context, but they fail to grasp this bigger context, this more significant context, which is the organism of special revelation and the God's administering of his kingdom through these various covenants. And once you do that, that changes your conception of what scripture is and therefore it changes your conception of the authors so that they're not just human authors like Shakespeare, but they're prophets who are servants in God's house. And that then affects how you interpret because now you're going to interpret in light of a different context, not just the limited context of the chapter, the book, and so on, or the limited context of historical, political, and cultural context in which th that author lived, but rather in terms of the true and the, the most significant context, the most hermeneutically powerful context, which is the history of special revelation viewed as a covenantal organism that is progressing over time under the direction of God. So let me give you an illustration of how biblical theology impacts hermeneutics. Uh, everyone knows that the book of Ezekiel has uh, the last nine chapters devoted to uh, this picture of the eschatological temple. And, you know, in, in Ezekiel chapter 40 and 41, he's describing the walls and the construction of the temple. Uh, in chapters 43 to 46, he describes the Levitical personnel, the priests and the Levites who are going to be uh, offering sacrifices and maintaining the clean-unclean distinction. In chapter 47, you have this river that's flowing from the throne through the temple out into the rest of the land of Israel, even down into the Dead Sea. And, uh, and it ends in chapter 48 with a description of the inheritance of the 12 tribes as they are surrounding the temple. So this is Ezekiel's eschatological temple. Now, how do we interpret this? Well, in light of this biblical theological context of understanding the organism of God's covenantal oversight of his people through scripture, we then need to see that Ezekiel is prophesying at a particular juncture in that history, in the unfolding organism He's prophesying at a very significant point, which is that he is prophesying during the exile. And so therefore, he is living on the boundary. He's living in a transition time from the first to the second level. So remember, I talked about these, this concept of the Abrahamic covenant, which is a covenantal form of the original promise of the gospel in Genesis 3.15. That promise... So you could take Genesis 3.15 and uh, Genesis 12 through the rest of Genesis, basically, which is just unpacking the promise. You could take that whole promise, basically the book of Genesis, without the, the pre-fall section. So from Genesis 3.15 to the end of the book of Genesis, which is all about God's promise, to your seed I will give this land, that promise gets fulfilled in two stages or two levels. The first level fulfillment is in the theocracy of Israel in the land, with Solomon's temple. 
that first level fulfillment is not the true fulfillment. It's only a fulfillment at the level of type and shadow. The second level fulfillment is the fulfillment in Christ, Christ and his church and the new creation. These two levels are connected to each other as type and shadow, as type and, uh, type and anti-type. Israel in the land, around the temple, focused on that uh, cultic epicenter, the temple, is God's holy people dwelling in God's holy land under God's uh, obedient king. And that picture of the kingdom of God is only a picture that ultimately is going to be shattered and come to an end in the exile. In the exile, the temple is destroyed, God's people are ex uh, removed from the land, and the Davidic kingship is terminated. But during that time of the exile, the great prophets, such as Jeremiah and Ezekiel and so on, they looked ahead to a future restoration of that kingdom, that the kingdom of God would be restored. Israel would be restored to the land under a new covenant with a new temple, and David would be their king. So the prophets then are prophesying during this really crucial point in the unfolding of God's uh, organism of special revelation, where the first level is coming to an end, but they're prophesying that the second level is going to be about to dawn. And of course, we know that it is ultimately going to be fulfilled in Christ. So this theme of the temple then, uh, it has to be understood in that whole, as all the Legos are being put together from before the fall, because the garden itself was like a temple and Adam was like a priest who was to guard it, Genesis 2.15. He was to guard it using that same word that's used of the priests later in uh, the book of Numbers, or the, the Levites actually in the book of Numbers. And uh, so the garden was a temple, but it was to be expanded to global dimensions. Of course, that temple project was brought to an end because of the fall. But then God's promising through uh, the seed in Genesis 3.15 that he's going to bring about that ultimate temple through the seed of the woman who's going to crush the serpent's head. God fulfills that promise at the first level in Solomon's temple. That first level fulfillment is not the true fulfillment. Christ comes in John 2.19 and says, he's cleansing the temple and he says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews, of course, said, it's taken 46 years for uh, Herod's temple to be restored. And of course, John comments on that and says, well, Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. But it's not just that his own body is the temple, it's also the corporate aspect of it. That is, he's the, he's the body, but his body, the church, is built upon that foundation. And so Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3.16 that we are God's temple. He says the same thing in Ephesians 2.21. Peter says that as well in 1 Peter 2.5, that we are living stones being built up into uh, a dwelling place for God. Then you get to the book of Revelation, Revelation 21 to 22, and you see the eschatological New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. And you also see the river of life flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, which echoes back to Ezekiel 47. So you have this whole development of the organism of special revelation from before the fall to after the fall, the first promise of the gospel, all the way into uh, Christ and the new covenant and the fulfillment in Revelation 21 and 22. And so you have to interpret Ezekiel's prophecy of the eschatological temple in Ezekiel 40 to 48 in light of that context. Ultimately here, the literary context of the rest of the book of Ezekiel doesn't really help you to determine how to interpret this prophecy. The historical context that he's living in the time of the exile and that he's living in Babylon with the exilic community doesn't really determine the answer to how to interpret this prophecy. The dispensationalists say, well, it's got to be taken literally and it's going to happen in the millennium. In the millennium, the temple is going to be literally rebuilt, rebuilt according to the dimensions and the uh, architectural plans that are laid out here in Ezekiel 40 and, and so on. Uh, but 
then that leads them to some pretty bizarre interpretations. That, that means then that the Levitical holiness code is going to be restored. The sacrificial system is going to be restored. That's literally what is stated in Ezekiel 43 to 46, four whole chapters that sound almost like the book of Leviticus all over again, talking about all the different sacrifices, the burnt offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering, and so on and so forth. The sprinkling of the even talks about sprinkling the blood on the altar and on the temple. Uh, is that all going to be literally uh, taking place in the millennium in the future? That directly contradicts the teaching of the book of Hebrews that Christ is the final sacrifice. He offered himself once for all as a sacrifice for sin, and that <clears throat> to bring back the literal Levitical sacrificial system is ultimately a denial of Christ and is re-crucifying Christ all over again. So that can't be. So how do we interpret it? Well, we interpret all of this, this whole section in Ezekiel 40 to 48 in light of this idea of two-level fulfillment. That, in other words, the prophets spoke in what's called prophetic idiom. That is, they used the language of the first level fulfillment, Israel in the land with Solomon's temple. They use all that language and idiom and earthly descriptions of physical temples and so on uh, as metaphors, as <clears throat> figures of speech, as ways of speaking of the antitype. The type, the, the language of the type becomes the prophetic idiom for the description of the antitype. The second level realities are described in the earthly language or idiom of the first level of fulfillment of the type and shadow. And so that helps us to understand a number of different things. For example, um, in Ezekiel 37, 24, um, it says, my servant David shall be king over them and they shall all have one shepherd. So looking ahead to that same, uh, if that's to be taken as referring to the millennial reign, uh, then a dispensationalist, to be consistent, would have to say that even Christ will not be reigning over them. It'll be David. Literally, David will be brought back from the dead to reign over the millennial kingdom. Um, but even dispensationalists know that that's not correct. Even they know that it's Christ who's going to be the king. And so uh, <clears throat> this language here, my servant David shall be king over them, has to be taken as prophetic idiom. So if we recognize that for David, why not recognize that for the sacrificial system as well? Um, <clears throat> another good example of this prophetic idiom is in Ezekiel 47, 10, when it describes the river flowing out of the throne and then out into the rest of the land of Israel. It says the river will flow into the Dead Sea and <clears throat> the Dead Sea will become alive again, right? It's dead because the high salt content, nothing can live there. There's no fish in the sea. There's no vegetation growing around it. But the river of life flowing out of the temple will flow into the Dead Sea and cause it to spring to life again. And it has this whole Edenic imagery. And this is going to be so fruitful that the, the Dead Sea is going to be full of life and fish. And it says, fishermen will stand beside the sea. From Engedi to Eneglayim, it will be a place for the spreading of nets. Engedi is one of the uh, towns on the border of the, uh, on the shore of the Dead Sea. And so, is that literally going to be fulfilled in that, in, those liter in that literal way? No, this is the earthly language or idiom of the first level fulfillment being used to describe the eschatological second level realities, the antitype even though it mentions fishermen and nets and, and Getty and so on, we don't have to take those literally. We can take those as colorful descriptions using the earthly language to describe the heavenly reality of the new creation. So here's a great example then where hermeneutics has to be informed by biblical theology. That biblical theology, in fact, provides the ultimate hermeneutic. So the usefulness of biblical theology for hermeneutics is that it helps us to interpret this 
very unique literature. This is not ordinary human literature where we're trying to understand the authorial intent of the human author. This is literature that is produced by the prophets of the covenant of God. And so our, in, our, under, our uh, goal is to understand God's intent, speaking through his prophets. And therefore, to do that, we have to understand the organism of covenant history from Genesis to Revelation, from the, the Adamic covenant of works to the first promise of the gospel to the Abrahamic covenant to the Mosaic covenant to the Davidic covenant to the new covenant and see how any given passage is connected to that overall structure. Without that context, without the context of the organism of covenant history, we won't be able to understand God's intent in communicating these things through his prophets.